<laughs> okay. Uh, we have our, our uh, timekeeper over here, Crystal. She'll be giving you the time uh, so that you know how long you've spoken and how long you have left to speak. Uh, Justin Hinckley, our SGA representative, and then Blaine Primazic, our government uh, instructor that will be asking the questions of you today. Hello. The first question I will direct towards Jerome Tillman, and then I will, the people farthest to his left will respond. Um, some political figures have called for budget reform, such as ending the Department of Education and leaving funding to the state. Where do you stand in this attempt at preventing, um, preventing this allocation of funds? Justin, before you begin, <laughs> we're going to allow them two minutes to give their introductions. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> uh, la ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll give you two minutes to introduce. One of the questions that we would like for you to a ask, answer to the audience members is why you're running uh, for this particular position or for Celeste re uh, uh, seeking re-election. Like many debates before this one, the debate organizers 
confided in him a long time ago, and after patiently waiting, settled on a date which happened to be inconvenient for his schedule. Now, Luis Flores is Washington, D.C. based legislative director whom the congressman has flown down here to represent him. will try to tell you that the congressman's working hard, working hard for you and working hard for El Paso. I think the facts tell a very different story. In the 16 years that Sylvester Reyes has been in Congress, he's missed more votes than almost every single member of Congress. In the 16 years that Sylvester Reyes has been in Washington, D.C., he has only passed six bills. Two of those were to rename buildings in El Paso. None of them moved this community or this country forward. And in those 16 years, he never held regular constituent meetings to listen to you so he knew what your concerns are, what your questions are, and your ideas to move this country and this community forward. So, if your congressman is not taking votes, if he's not showing up to work, if he's not passing legislation, if he can't even be bothered to campaign here in person, and instead sends his legislative director down from D.C. to El Paso, who, by the way, is not even from El Paso like most of his Washington, D.C. staff, if he can't even be bothered to do that, what is Sylvester Reyes doing? You may have seen the billboards, Reyes works. Ask yourself, who is he working for? El Paso needs a congressman who's going to work for you, who's going to work to change a situation in El Paso that has led to 10% unemployment. More than 30,000 people right now cannot find work despite looking for it. It's led to a situation that 12 years into his term, we have the worst VA in the country, not the best. I'm asking for your vote and support on May 29th to send me to Congress to change the situation so that we have a full service, full time representative representing your interests. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Mr. Work. My name is Luis Torres. I am the Legislative Director for Congress for Reyes. And I'm here today because I was asked to be here uh, by the community uh, to represent Congressman Reyes, who is in Washington, D.C., working for you. He's voting. He's casting votes. The House is in session at this moment as we speak. But I'm gladly here to provide you some highlights of his record and the great work that he's doing on behalf of El Paso. Over the course of his career, it's important to know that Congressman Reyes has taken over 10,000 votes. Over 70 bills include language that he's authored that directly benefits El Paso. Some of those votes have been to increase the Pell Grant for college students, have been to decrease the student interest rates on loans, have been to expand the federal work study program so people can afford to go to college. Some of those votes have been taken to pass the DREAM Act, which the House Democrats passed it and it was stalled in the Senate by the Republicans. Some of those votes have helped secure funding for critical projects and investment, the $1 billion from the stimulus project, the stimulus act, which was not a favor, created two new Head Starts, a fire station, 300 bus stops, a new veterans transition center for our veterans who are coming from abroad who are fought for this country. Congressman Reyes has delivered. The 70 bills that I mentioned include language for 125 for some metro buses, 7 million for the Medical Center of the Americas, countless more for the passport office, for the courthouse. Those are results. That is experience. Those are actual things that you can look at in terms of a record. We have someone here who doesn't want the congressman side of the story, doesn't want me to be here to give you any of that information. And to tell you that when he was on the city council, he voted to cut housing for people with disabilities. He fought against the police unions who were trying to protect their pension. He also cut or voted to not support 150 jobs. He talks about unemployment. You can't be to create jobs when you vote to not create them. Congressman Reyes has proven true leadership. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Corey Rome. I'm the Republican running for Congressional District 16 here in El Paso. Just let me tell you a little bit about myself. Currently, I'm serving in the United States Army Reserve as, as a lieutenant colonel. I actually joined the military back in 1985, so I've got 27 years of, of service at this point. I also feel at home here because at one point when I was working over at UTEP in the ROTC department, I was the chief of staff there as well as the recruiting officer and an instructor of the military science class. I was actually on the faculty here at El Paso Community College there at uh, my very campus. So I actually uh, was a full professor at UTEP as well as El Paso Community College. 
reason I'm running is that I'm disgusted with what's going on with, with our country right now. We have a national debt of almost $16 trillion. The Democrats have no viable answers to bring that down. They're continuing to talk about raising taxes, raising taxes, enlarging the government, making the, the government a bigger focus every day in each and every one of your lives. Some issues I bring up, uh, filled gas this morning, it was $3.75 over where I live. It was $1.83 three years ago when the current administration has taken over. And don't think that it was not related to what's going on in Congress right now. Three years ago when the new president took over, we had 12 million people unemployed. Now we have more than 13 million Americans that are unemployed. So you hear on the news some of these biased networks, oh, the unemployment rate is going down. There's a million more people now that are unemployed than there was three years ago. The unemployment, unemployment rate, that, rate that the Department of Labor is releasing is about 8.3%. Actually, it's about 12 or 13 percent if you actually look at all the people that are, have stopped looking for work, okay? Or they're underemployed, they got a college degree, and, and they're working as a greeter at Walmart, for example. So we can do a lot more for this economy. now with the predetermined questions for each of the candidates. Let me remind you that you have two minutes to answer uh, the question, okay? We will uh, first begin uh, our questioning and uh, direct it towards Paul Johnson and then we will go right, ending on uh, Mrs. Carrasco. Um, <clears throat> some political figures have called for budget reform such as ending the Department of Education and leaving the funding to the state. Where do you stand on this position? that 
the entrance rates have got to be lower and very low for our students. It is not fair for a student to go four years in a university and then graduate with a degree, can't find a job, but has over two, three, four hundred thousand dollars in debt, and he can't even, he or she can't even work. So lowering the entrance rates would help these students maintain, look for work, and while they're working, they can pay back this loan. I have some ideas that maybe I can, as a congressman, would run and instead of a whole lot of money that these students are paying back, that once they finish their degree, maybe the government can cut half of that bill as an incentive program to graduate from higher education. There are certainly places in the federal budget where we have to look at reorganizing, where we have to look at cutting. And we really don't have a choice. We have a $16 trillion debt. We're running $1 trillion annual deficits and we cannot continue to spend ourselves into room. We need to elect people who are gonna go out there and make some tough choices. However, in the Department of Education, I think there's a lot more we can do before we cut. Where I would like to see the Department of Education exceed and excel at the federal level is investing in early childhood education so that we foster a lifelong love of learning and intellectual curiosity instead of focusing on issues like No Child Left Behind, which is raising a generation of expert test takers and test teachers, but is losing what it means to be well-educated and intellectually curious in this world. We should also focus resources on hiring math and science teachers. That's something where we could do much better. And we need to do a better job at extending financial aid, student loans, grants, and work-study programs to Americans and El Pasoans who need it. I would not have been able to go to Columbia University and graduate there without the help of student loans, grants, and other financial aid. Unfortunately, we don't have a Congress that's willing to make these tough decisions, make these investments, and make these priorities. I pointed out that you have a congressman who's in the bottom 5% of those who actually take votes and make things happen. I asked earlier who he's working for. When Luis Botas, on behalf of the congressman, responded, uh, he, uh, he tried to say that I cut 150 jobs for voting to. Those 150 jobs were the Boeing Corporation here in El Paso, Texas, one of the wealthiest corporations in the world. $64 billion in revenue. And he and Mr. Reyes want me to give away your tax dollars to them. Maybe it's because Boeing and their PACs have given Congressman Reyes over $45,000. Maybe it's because Congressman Reyes helped award Boeing a $200 million project on the U.S.-Mexico border that hired all three of his children. How does it feel to have 30,000 people out of work in El Paso to have a congressman who doesn't show up to work but is able to get his children jobs through defense contractors? Well, those are certainly some of the proposals. Some people want to cut the Department of Education. The Congress disagrees with that. Pell Grants are really important. He voted to increase Pell Grants for students. He voted to decrease the interest rates on student loans. So you're not penalized, like Mr. Johnson said, with all this debt uh, after you pursue your college education. Um, he also voted to expand and pass the DREAM Act in the House, which is very important for a lot of people. The Republicans saw that in the Senate. Uh, so he agrees with providing more investment, more resources for education. Uh, let me just clarify a couple of things here. Um, the country needs jobs. People need jobs. When the Republicans ran, when they took over the House, they said jobs, jobs, jobs. And now they want you to forget that and to talk about the deficit and the spending that Mr. O'Rourke is talking about. They didn't talk about that when they were giving tax breaks to rich people, to super rich people who didn't need that. But now they're talking about it, when you need jobs. When I mentioned the jobs, Mr. O'Rourke did vote against giving 100, creating 150 jobs. The majority of the city council voted to provide Boeing an incentives package to stay here, which by all means was a very small incentives package for 150 jobs, $41,000 salaries a year. That is failed leadership. Now he wants you to gamble to send him to D.C. so that he can work for you. Well, I already told you, he wasn't able to show that he could work for the people he represented in Segundo Barrio. Segundo Barrio saw an increase in some places of poverty of over 10%. That's right, people actually got poorer in his district while he was in office. He also, what did he do in response? 
cut housing for people with disabilities, fought the police unions, and then he voted against 150 jobs. And now he says he's willing to raise the retirement age. He mentioned that in a different debate. That's not leadership. And I won't get into the family issue because it's heavily inappropriate. I won't respond to that. <laughs> Take first of all a minute to, to rebut every time he says something bad about the Republicans that most of the time it's 100% false from what it actually is. Currently there are 27 jobs bills that have been passed by a bipartisan a House of Representatives that are sitting on the Senate's desk that uh, Harry Reid refuses to actually bring to vote. And Congress, uh, Congressman Reyes has voted against all 27 again. 27 of those laws he's uh, voted against. So he is not Mr. Pro-Jobs, like he says, and it's not the Republicans that don't want to bring jobs. The Republicans most definitely do want to bring jobs. Now the question actually talked about budget reform. I am, uh, and I've been on record as saying, I think the Department of Education is entirely too big. I believe that the, the, uh, the job of education belongs to the state as well as the local governments. Now I was misquoted the other day, but I'm not talking about basically having the state pay for everything. What happens right now is we pay a lot of federal taxes. That money goes up to the federal government, and then the federal government puts that money back down to the states and says, we're going to give you this money if you do this, OK? So that money doesn't need to go up to the federal government and then come down back to the states with all the rules and regulations that go with that. The state and the local government are more than capable of taking care of that. So we need money for, for our funding for education but it doesn't need to go straight from the federal government with all the mandates that the Department of Education has put on over the years. Now there's other ways to pay for college as well. I, having served 27 years in the military, used my GI Bill, something I earned as a combat veteran. There's tuition assistance. There's many ways to pay for college other than just getting money from, from the government. So we want to look at all different forms of funding for the education that we have out there. For the audience's purpose, will you recite the question? To restate the question, some political figures have called for budget reform, such as ending the Department of Education and leaving the funding to the states. Where do you stand on this issue? I, I believe that the Department of Education footprint is too big. 6% funding comes from the federal level. The rest of it is picked up at subordinate levels in government and I think the influence should match the investment. The responsibility that we need to take a look at is whether or not we are preparing at the elementary and secondary level students who can qualify for post-secondary education. And the numbers don't give us those kinds of indications. Four and a half billion dollars taken out of public education funding at the state level. In other words, from Mr. Reyes. Another word from Mr. O'Rourke. Another 140 million taken out of vocational education. Another word from Mr. Reyes. Another word from Mr. O'Rourke. Or I don't want to leave anybody else out in the interest of equality. I didn't hear anything from anyone on those. I sat in the front row on those debates when those dollars were being cut and what things we could do to try to defend those. We need to put the assets and resources where they will best serve the long-term needs of this community and this country, and that is in the classroom. The social, economic, and political future of this community and this country is in the classroom, and it is being neglected. I teach in middle school, I know. I teach here, I know. I've taught at UT El Paso and the University of Phoenix, I know. And when I talked to businesses, when I was three years at the Great El Paso Chamber of Commerce as its development director, one of the biggest things businesses would talk about is us graduating students from our secondary school system who are not ready to move into the labor force. We better put their assets and resources locally so we are giving genuinely qualified students access and opportunities to go to higher education. We need to fix it at the ground level. That's what the assets and resources need to be. is just like the EPA, too overreaching. They're too far away from where we need the money. But throwing monies 
at a failing system already is not the solution either. The administration tried a uh, race to the top. The prior administration tried no child left behind. Both of those programs have some good uh, features in them, but neither of them have worked. Studies indicate that the money should be sent to the state and the government should create an environment for the schools, set the bars, set a regulation, set rules that the schools must follow. We can't just throw money because there are studies out there that say we, have, we are not paying three times as much for an education as before and education has not improved, so money is not the question. It's what the standards are and the federal government should set them how the teachers teach in the classroom and follow the standards. So we need to have programs and policies in place that will help advance the education if we want to compete in a global world. We cannot just simply say, bring the money from Washington and have no means or manners or, or ways to uh, utilize those funds. And putting the resources in the classroom, I agree with that, but money isn't going to do it. So we need to find out what works and simply saying, bring the money from the Department of Education, do away with the Department of Education, is not the um, ultimate answer because we know that the federal government is not the answer to all of our uh, problems. Thank you. And, and thank you to all the candidates for our first question. Our next question will be directed first to Mr. O'Rourke. And our next question will concern online piracy. And so considering recent congressional debate over the SOPA and PIPA bills, where do you stand on future attempts to prevent online piracy? The PIPA and SOPA bills were well-intentioned efforts to protect intellectual property rights and creative development on the internet. We want to make sure that as musical or visual or gaming artists create products that they know that their investment will be protected will hire them, that they'll get a return on the hours of creativity that they invested in these products. However, in practice, both SOPA and PIPA would have had a chilling effect on investment and use of the internet. I think they were misguided bills, the wrong bills for this country, and the wrong bills for uh, Congress to support. So I want to be very clear, clear about this. I'm adamantly opposed to PIPA or SOPA or any iteration of those bills that would restrict your access to content on the internet or unfairly penalize you for linking to content that some other third party might have illegally uh, put up on the internet. As an owner of a small business that is an internet-based business, Stan Street Technology Group that I started 14 years ago with some friends here in El Paso that has employed dozens of El Pasoans in the kind of high-wage, high-tech, internet-based jobs that far too many of our young people leave El Paso to go find other places. I know the value of this industry, the value of creating these kinds of jobs in El Paso, and I wouldn't do anything to adversely impact anyone's ability to do that. Now, I think there's got to be a better way to do this. There are laws in the books today that enforce intellectual property rights. We, we can enforce those laws and make sure that those enforcement powers are properly funded and followed through on, but I don't know that we need more regulation that, again, will have a chilling effect on job creation at a time when we most need jobs in the United States and in El Paso. Mr. Torres, the question will go to you. Sure, and you know, the congressman had mentioned publicly that he is opposed to SOPA. He thinks it's the wrong approach, it's too broad, it's too intrusive. There are severe, severe issues, though, that need to be addressed, issues of piracy, people are concerned about piracy issues with pornography, inappropriate content for children, for example. Those are serious issues, but SOPA is not the way to do it, and he's opposed to it. The real way to do it is to foster people who are going to make better programmers, better engineers, better mathematicians who are going to filter out that content and allow businesses and different technology firms to incorporate that software, to incorporate that technology. Now, Congressman Reyes, his work in Washington has been to foster that sort of uh, investment in, in, in STEM, what we call STEM. Some of you here may know science, technology, engineering, math, for short, it's called STEM. Uh, he founded a caucus called the Diversity and Innovation Caucus to push for more resources for students who want to pursue those careers, especially underrepresented groups, like women, for example. They make up a very small portion 
of students who are graduating in those careers, Latinos, African Americans. Now UTEP and EPCC here are doing a really great job. They're preparing students for that. UTEP, for example, is the number one at school graduating Hispanic engineers. Now the next part is that we need to create jobs, engineering jobs, highly skilled manufacturing jobs. And Congressman Reyes has been pushing for those jobs as well. We fund financial aid to prepare students, and then we help them create, we help them get jobs in our community, good jobs, good paying jobs, like the jobs that Mr. O'Rourke voted against. 150 jobs, $41,000 a year, <coughs> voted against that because he said, I'm not sure what he said, I think the paper will have it saying it was a bribe, but he voted to extend those tax incentives for other people while he was on city council. So the question then is not, where's Mr. Reyes today? Mr. Reyes is working for you. Where was Mr. O'Rourke when he was in the city council? That's a real question. Thank you. Okay, same question to Mr. Uh, Rowan. Okay, so it was a bad law. It was badly, poorly written, didn't get support from either the Republicans or the Democrats. However, if we do look back, and no, I would not have voted for it either. If we do look back, they're trying to protect people set, that make movies, that release songs, artists. So we want to go in and protect those people, but do we really want the government going in and regulating another aspect of our lives? So if this law would have passed, it would have basically allowed the government to go in, look at all the different internet websites that are out there and say, okay, we're gonna shut you down because of this. Oh, you're linked to the, this other website, which has maybe some, some music on there, okay? So we want to limit the size of the government. That, that's the biggest thing, one of the biggest things I'm trying to get through today. Anything that empowers the government or makes the government bigger or gives them more reach, I'm going to be opposed for and vote on these. You know, we got laws out there that say which light bulb you have to put in in your house, which toilet you have to install. They're going to put restrictions on which car you can drive here in the future. Do we want more government, government, government in our lives? No, we don't. So this law, which it would have regulated the internet, was very poorly written. Probably something will come through in the future that we may look at when I get to Congress. We'll take a look at that because we want to protect all the, the artists out there and the people that are, are stimulating the economy. Sorry, we're having technical difficulties, but the same question goes to Mr. Tillman. Does that mean I need to wait until you get the technical difficulties? No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> I think the spirit of both pieces of legislation was good. One of the best assets that the United States has to offer to the rest of the planet is its intellectual property. The birth of the internet and a lot of the technology that has gone on with that. What things we need to do to protect that, I think are key and critical. We need to see some surgical revisions to the law to make sure that we protect those but not have any First Amendment restrictions to people's ability to, to speak. A larger concern that I want to bring to that is the reason why we have these kinds of situations is evident on the day is here today. Two individuals who could have and should have been cooperating the whole time with the 22 combined years they had in office. Why weren't they working together to get after these kinds of issues? Why do we wait until the election season to highlight the differences instead of talking about what efforts have been made for cooperation at the national level and the local level to serve the combined best interests of everybody who's in this audience and everybody who's in the 16th Congressional District. I think we need to take a look at that as a benchmark or watershed mark and what decisions we need to make on Election Day. It's the same problem that's happening at the national level. Dialogue, compromise, and consensus have been pushed over the cliff and has been replaced by acrimony and finger pointing. And what we should have at this level, at the national level, is no finger pointing, but clasped hands. Good spirited piece of legislation. It needs some surgical changes, but we have to think how do we best protect the intellectual property, which is one of the economic strengths of the United States of America. of legislation are another indication of how the expansion of the federal government is intrusive in our lives. 
They create havoc. They tell us what we can and what we cannot do. And it's costly for us. Think about it is what they did is they tried in all conscience, good conscience, to address an issue. But like everything else the federal government does, they overextend. They don't know how to limit themselves and stay out of our lives. One of the benefits of, this, of these two bills, though, has been that now you have other creative minds out there finding ways to limit pornography and piracy on the, on the internet. But these two bills were not the way to accomplish that. Yes, China is taking our technology. Yes, they take advantage of us. But we cannot let the federal government think they have a solution every time there's a problem. Because it costs you and me and everybody else more in time and jobs. So although it was going to uh, discourage job growth, which is what the federal government tends to do with every one of their big bills, we lose jobs. In a, in a minimal sense, it's creating jobs to find alternatives how to implement these bills and how to keep people from pirating on our internet. So I, I disagree with the two bills. It's like everything else, they had a good idea, but it, it didn't quite accomplish it. Just like uh, cap and trade, they always start with a good idea, overextend, they overreach. So we need to be careful with the government. Just like health care, now they've blurred the line between the separation of church and state. We just cannot continue to let the federal government affect, a lot, affect our lives in every way, from simple things being on the internet, to make it big things, to health care, to abortions, to churches, to jobs. It just goes on. There's no limit to what the federal government will do in our lives if we allow them to do it. Okay, we have one last question and then we'll open it up to the audience. Okay, we're going to address this question to Mr. Torres and then go roundabout. If conditions in Syria worsen or intelligence units have gathered that Iran has nuclear weapons, and I mean a credible threat, um, would you support military action in this region? That's a very serious topic. And Congressman Ray is actually mm -hmm. a Vietnam veteran. I don't know if many of you know that. He uh, served the country in Vietnam. He came back. He actually uh, graduated from the El Paso Community College. So he's an alumni of BPCC. Um, before that, though, he experienced the war. And he experienced the, uh, the, the sacrifices that people have to make. And before I could go on and answer that question, I just want to say some of the the veterans here who are in the panel um, really appreciate their service and what they've done for the country. Um, questions of war are very serious, and the congressman thinks that with any threat, Syria or otherwise, we need to have all options available, but we need to be measured, we need to exhaust diplomatic channels, 
The same questions that we would ask in every single potential conflict. The war in Iraq, he disagreed with the war in Iraq. He voted against that. He said, absolutely not. There is no credible evidence. There is no link. We should not be in there. He supported the deployment of our troops, come back home. But when it comes to the safety of the country, we need to make sure that all options are on the table, that we exhaust diplomatic channels, and that we go through all possible venues before we put our folks, our young people, in combat, in that sort of violence. Congressman Ray is, uh, is very proud of his military record. Actually, he was just endorsed uh, uh, last week by the Veterans for Democracy and Security, which is a veterans group uh, that thanked him for his service for our veterans. There's a lot more that we need to do for our veterans. We need to, yes, continue making improvements to the VA. We need to continue making sure that veterans don't have to wait for their benefits when they come back, that they get their benefits that they so rightly earned. We need to fight off attacks in Washington for people <laughs> wanting to cut those programs. The Budget Control Act was a bill that the Republicans pushed and, 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 and got the law that would have cut these programs. Mr. O'Rourke would have supported that. Congressman Ray is, is not that congressman. He supports our veterans and their soldiers. I've been in the military for 27 years now. I actually came back from Afghanistan in September of last year, about five months ago. So I've been firsthand right where the combat is. I've led soldiers in Desert Shield and Desert Storm, led soldiers in Afghanistan just five months ago. So as a military veteran and currently serving Army Reserve officer, I'm the biggest uh, proponent for not wanting to send combat troops into Iran, okay? So I don't support necessarily right now as a first step to go into Iran with combat troops. We need to look at all available options. One, sanctions against them. Number two, all diplomacy. But the problem is, there's a madman dictator who's leading Iran right now. They are developing weapons of mass destruction. We have intel, we have satellites. We know what's going on in the Middle East and in Iran. So it's not really a question, are they thinking of doing this? They are developing nuclear capabilities. So we need to, because of what his stated objectives are, to wipe out Israel and continue on. You know, we've seen what terrorists have done on 911. We we know that they hate the American way of life. This is a critical uh, area that we need to uh, really look at hardly here. There's a few veterans up here on the stage. Uh, I believe I have most experienced, uh, at least in terms of years wise, as, as my comrades. But, but foreign policy is something I've studied hard, looked at. I've been to uh, you know, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan. I've been deployed actually to Okinawa, Japan. Spent some time in uh, Korea. So I've seen the world more than in some of the people up here. So I'm a great choice who can go in, reasonably look through these things, use experience, and solve the problems that need to be solved. I want to make sure I had the question right. Did you say Syria? Okay, so we, okay, so we're talking regionally. I think that we need to weigh and measure our priorities. If we're talking about doing things in the name of for the for the sake of humanitarianism to preserve and protect human life in other places. We don't need to shop for a catastrophe 7,000 miles across the ocean, but we've seen 47,000 Mexicans right across the Rio Grande be killed. There's plenty to do right in our own backyard. And when I hear about the resolutions that have been offered by uh, Mr. Work as an example for legalization, uh, Mr. Reyes talking about fast and furious, from the records I read, nine out of 10 weapons that are killing Mexicans in Mexico come from the United States. Do I think we need to take care of, or at least examine, the threat situations that exist in Southwest Asia? Yes, I do. But I also believe that we don't need as big a footprint in that part of the world as we have right now. I believe set peace battles and conventional forces on the battlefield are almost a thing of the past. Our special operations forces have a larger, greater capability and a measured effectiveness so we don't have to put as many soldiers in the area. Two examples that I'll cite. We didn't have more than 25 guys go in to eliminate Osama bin Laden and eliminate that threat to the United States. We had two hostages in Somalia, another group of special operations forces to go in there. 
instead of going in with a shotgun blast for the military, we need to start doing some strategic rifle shooting. Special Operations Forces to examine how we have to go after these threats and not put these great big military targets out there that are exploited by our enemies. So those are the areas I think we should be paying attention to. Overseas for more than 
three, four times to a battle zone, that will take a big effect on you. Thank you. Let me say this, you know, the regimes in, in Syria and Iran are some of the most evil the world has ever seen. Bashar al-Assad in Syria is massacring his own people, almost 10,000 uh, at this point since the Arab Spring began. Iran with Ahmadinejad has uh, murdered his own citizens, is battling his saber against the United States, uh, and both have denied the right of uh, the state of Israel to exist, and both have denied uh, the Holocaust. These are clearly evil people whose powers and ambitions should be checked, and certainly in the case of Iran, it's in our interest and the interest of the region and the world to make sure they do not get a nuclear weapon. Having said that, I think there's still a lot more that the United States and the world can do on the diplomatic front, on the front of economic sanctions, uh, in working with those and against those two regimes to check their power and growth. We have seen what's happened when we send our troops into a conflict in a part of the world without clear, definable goals and without an exit strategy. Over the last 11 years, uh, the government's own accounting office has shown that despite the number of Americans who honorably and nobly, nobly sacrificed their lives and put their lives in the line in service in Afghanistan and Iraq, you and I as the American taxpayer have spent over a trillion dollars and almost $60 billion of that is unaccounted for. When those service members return to El Paso and to the United States and Fort Bliss, and many people up here have said this, they are not being taken care of. I've knocked on over 12,000 doors so far. I've met thousands of veterans, such as David Vadas, who's sitting in the audience, who served in the Marines in the first Gulf War, who simply are not being taken care of by this VA. Whether it's a disability claim that takes years to resolve, whether it's a benefits issue that has no resolution, whether it's writing or calling their congressman repeatedly and not getting a response, we have a VA that was recently ranked the worst in the country. So before we send more people into war, let's make sure that we can take care of